Hello, everybody. Welcome to the very, very first Mystery Box Show presents Sex People, um, brought to you by the very, very fine folks here at the Mystery Box Show. My name is Eric. I'm going to be your host for this evening. Um, you may all know the Mystery Box Show is uh, is typically a storytelling event where people tell true stories all about sex and sexuality. Um, and don't worry, the, the sex stories, the sex story shows are not going anywhere. That is our that is our bread and butter and that's where our hearts live. But we decided uh, as the year's coming to a close, why not mix things up a little bit, try something new. And, uh, and especially since we know so many amazing people who, uh, who, who can talk about sexual topics, let's have a conversation. So, um, so we'll be back with storytelling shows in 2021, don't you worry. But for tonight, um, we're we're having a conversation because our our main goal at the at the at the Mystery Box Show is to normalize talking about sex and sexuality. And 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 we have a terrific panel of experts here. Um, is it cheesy to say sex experts? I feel like it is. I feel like that diminishes things. But they're experts on sex, and uh, and we're going to be talking about a variety of sexual topics, uh, including having your questions later in the show. And uh, I can actually, um, let me put this up here. If you have a question for our panelists later in the show, you can text them here to this question, uh, into to this number, and they'll come in anonymously. You can also ask in the comments section. Um, but I wanted to start off with a brief thought about what sex positivity means to me, um, or, or, or what being sex positive means. and this is going to lead into meeting everybody tonight because for me, I feel like being sex positive for me means that I have a particular vision of what I think a sex positive world looks like and, and what I want to be working towards. And just about everybody I know who is who considers themselves to be sex positive, I feel like everybody has a slightly different vision of their ideal sex positive world. But until we get there, and we are probably very far from that at the moment, we are all in the same boat, paddling in the same direction. And that's what I like. I like that we can have disagreements, we can have different opinions, and yet all still be paddling in the same direction. Um, and that's that goes for everybody I think you'll be hearing from tonight. Everybody's like to, likely to have their own individual opinions on any given subject. And even if we don't agree on everything, uh, maybe we'll hear something in a way that we've never heard it before. So um, personally, I'm excited to hear everybody's perspectives. Um, before bringing our panelists on board, uh, I want to introduce to you our production assistant extraordinaire, Nicole Perkins. Uh, Nicole's gonna be keeping an eye on the chat window. So Nicole, meet the audience. Audience, meet Nicole. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, I am the production assistant for the Mystery Box Show. I am usually behind the scenes, both at our main stage shows in Portland, as well as our YouTube live streams. Uh, so I will be here reading all of your comments, engaging, and feel free to pass questions along to me that you want the panelists to hear or Eric or Reba to hear. Um, and of course, as always, um, be kind, no yucking anyone's yum, no meanies allowed. Uh, and I'll be here to chat with you all. That's awesome. Thanks so much, Nicole. Um, you will all get to know her over the course of the evening. Um, and now with that, it's time to start to introduce our panelists. So um, here we go. Uh, <laughs> the controls are getting a little out of my control. So um, we'll start here. Uh, I want to introduce to you somebody who is very dear to us, a good friend. Uh, she is a certified intimacy educator, a professional coach, and uh, and the author of Tongue Tied, Untangling Communication in Sex, Kink, and Relationships. Uh, she just started doing a weekly column called Splash, uh, a weekly advice column called Splash through Substack, which is kind of like uh, Patreon for writers. Uh, and we'll we'll have we'll have a link to everything we talk about tonight in the show's description, so you can check that out there. Um, so she's a three-time storyteller with the Mystery Box Show, and her upcoming book, The Ultimate Guide to Threesomes, comes out on March 9th. And there's going to be uh, a virtual launch party through Shebop, who is tonight's sponsor. Will you please all welcome Stella Harris? Hello. This is Stella, everybody. Um, Stella, just to get to know you a little bit, um, 
a random question. Uh, tell us about a favorite place that you've traveled to and what you liked about it so much. I am missing travel so much. Um, I, I love my home, but yeah, I'm getting a little tired of these walls. Um, last year I went to Paris um, by myself. I think it was the first vacation I'd ever taken just entirely by myself and it was kind of spontaneous. Um, a, a working vacation, my laptop was with me. I was still doing a little work, but it's uh, it's more pleasant from the cafes of Paris. Um, and yeah, it was nice to take off without a plan, to be spontaneous, to be have my own agenda, do what I want when I want for as long as I wanted, you know, wandering around beautiful spots, looking at museums, doing a little tindering in Paris, uh, the, whole, the whole package. Oh, that sounds incredible. I've never been to Paris and I can only imagine. It was, um, it was great in the winter too, because almost nobody was there. So I had everything to myself. Mm. No, I'm missing that even though I've never been there. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, we're gonna move right along um, and bring on our next panelist. Um, our next panelist is, uh, sorry, I'm looking at my notes here. Our next panelist has been a relational sex therapist for the past six years, and he's taught the sociology of gender and sexualities for the past 13 years. He's told four stories with the Mystery Box Show. He is also a dear friend of ours. Will you please welcome Matthew Garretts? Hey, Matthew, how's it going? Good, I'm making sure I didn't have myself on mute, so. I, <laughs> no, you're doing just fine. Um, our question for you tonight, uh, have you been, during, during, the, uh, during the long quarantine, have you been binging any TV shows lately? Yes, uh, The Americans. I love that show. I think it is amazing the way that they can explore relationships with this backdrop of being spies in the 80s. So it's a lovely kind of throwback and it like watching people do like the normal things that come up in relationships, but with the topics of trying to hide your identity is amazing. Wow. I've heard great things about it for years and, and just never got to check it out. It's TV shows like binging, it, they pile up, right? And then they're like a time commitment, but this seems like the time to, to, to check some of them off the list. Absolutely. Cool. Well, we're so glad you're here. We're gonna move along and uh, meet the rest of the panelists and we'll bring you all back on board in a moment. Um, our next panelist is, uh, is a story coach, a holistic health coach and a model. Um, she is the executive producer of the Mystery Box Show and of course the host of our podcast and the regular host of all of our live streams uh, with our storytelling shows. You can see her modeling work on Instagram at happyapplepdx. And again, those links are in the video description on YouTube. Um, and of course she'll be back at her hosting duties uh, when we have our Valentine's Day show tickets on sale uh, right now. But for tonight, please welcome Reba Sparrow. Hi. Hello Reba. Hello. How are Eric. you doing tonight? <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> You tell the people that we're in the same house, but in different rooms. Oh, that's supposed to be, you're breaking the illusion. Oh, <laughs> it's a secret, it's a secret. It doesn't, yeah. Does, it doesn't look like we're in the same place at all, does it? No, we're not. Would it be weird yeah. if like I could reach my hand over and it showed up in like your screen? <laughs> <laughs> um, special question for you tonight. Reba, do you have a favorite podcast? I do actually. Um, I'm very selective with my podcasting, but my favorite is the Rich Roll podcast. I know you mentioned something that not a lot of people know about me, which is that I am also a certified holistic health coach. So I really nerd out on health and wellness. And Rich Roll is a plant based ultra marathon runner and has the most fascinating guests on his podcast um, that range just unique people, but he's also just such a great interviewer. Um, he's a former lawyer. I feel like that has something to do with how well he articulates and like gets to the interview, you know, questioning part of it. So yeah, I've been listening to Rich Roll pretty, pretty religiously. Nice. I've, I've, uh, of course, I've listened to a couple of those with you too. And I've, I always appreciate how in depth he goes in those interviews and how personal he is. Um, cool. So recommendation there. Um, we have one more panelist to go. So Reba, I'm going to take you off screen for just a moment as we get to our final 
panelists tonight. Our final panelist is a sex educator, a performer and uh, self-described dildo slinger coming all the way to us from New York City, where she once flew to Portland and uh, told us told a story at our show. Uh, you can check out her upcoming Sex Church with Lola and Hunter on Sunday, December 13th. Again, links in the description. Uh, and <laughs> she also wanted to let everybody know that if you watch, uh, if you happen to watch uh, High Maintenance in season three, episode five, she's the girl being eaten out. Um, you can find her on Instagram at Dirty Lola. Please welcome Dirty Lola. Hey, Lola. Hi. <laughs> How are you tonight? I'm good. <laughs> Thank you for staying up so late where you are. It's uh, it's three hours ahead of Portland time. It isn't late. This is like my early evening. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, I'm glad that it's not uh, not too abnormal. No. Um, before the show, we were all talking about books, and I'm curious, what was the last book that you've read or uh, or that you're currently reading? The pandemic has made it really hard for me to actually physically read, like, an actual book, but I've been listening to audiobooks, and currently I'm listening to Practical Magic. Um, and before that, oh, I don't remember which David Sedaris book, but I've been listening to just so many things, and it's it's great when you can't concentrate <laughs> long enough to actually sit and read. So I've been reading so many things. Nice. Is the is the David Sedaris audiobook? Is it narrated by David Sedaris? Yes, which makes it There's even better. <laughs> There's no other way to, to to listen to his words, right? No, no. You need you need every little like the way he says words. You need all of it. You need you need it in your life. Yeah. Well, we're so glad you're here. I'm going to take you off screen for just a moment, and then we're going to bring everybody back. So we are almost ready to get everybody on screen. Um, that is the panel for tonight, and we're going to dive right in. Uh, so here's here's how it's going to work is we're gonna start with the introduction of a topic and then our panelists are gonna have uh, the opportunity to talk to one another, discuss their experiences. And meanwhile, if you're watching us, whether you're on YouTube or whether you're on Facebook, if you have a question about something somebody says, uh, leave a comment and Nicole will pick that up and, uh, and insert it into the conversation when appropriate. So with that said, um, I wanted to start tonight with, um, with a topic that a lot of people I think contend with in their sexual journey, I know personally I have, um, the idea of shame. And we hear a lot about it at, at, at our show, that a lot of the stories that we have um, focus on the subject of shame. And whenever I think about it, I, I think about one story we had uh, where this, this storyteller named James, he talked about when he was a younger man and he basically spent an entire weekend having sex with uh, a kind of sexual mentor. And I wanted to play just a, li a little bit of his story to, to show you what he was talking about. I had just gotten the most incredible education on sexual integration, personal awakening, and joy that anybody has ever received. Mary didn't just fuck my brains out, she fucked my shame out. She opened for me the door to a lifetime of joy and sex. And that's, and you could hear the cheers when he said that, like way to go for having sex so good that it just, it just gets rid of your shame. And I feel like, especially at our show where people craft stories that, you know, reach towards a peak, a climax, if you will. Um, that tends to be the trajectory of shame is I did this thing and then I got to this place where, you know, I realized that shame was just too much heavy baggage and so I got rid of it. But I, I feel like it's not quite that for everybody. It's not quite that simple to be like, oh yeah, I had shame and then boom, shame was gone. So I was curious about everybody's perspectives uh, from, their, from all their respective fields here. So I'm going to add everybody back into our stream there is everybody, and um, and I'd like to start with Stella, if uh, if that's okay. Stella, to start with you, how would you how would you define shame? Well, shame is a huge umbrella category, and I think for all of us who work in the sexuality field, it's it's probably one of the biggest challenges we hear from people. I think shame manifests in in the messages that we get growing up um, from our culture, our family, our religions. I mean, it can be from anything. Um, 
and it sticks with us for life. And yes, I wish all it took was was one really good lay and, and people would feel cured, um, but it usually is a lot more work than that. Working with educators, coaches, therapists, doing an awful lot of unpacking. You know, people feel bad about their bodies. You know, this was something I even saw just when I was working retail, everybody said something bad about their bodies as soon as they looked in the mirror. Um, and now that's something I deal with as a coach as well. Um, our culture profits if we feel crummy about ourselves. You know, um, magazines telling us we need to be thinner and and smell a certain way. I mean, you know, y'all have seen these discourses before, um, but it really sinks <laughs> into us. And when I teach classes, even just asking people, you know, what body parts they learned growing up, you know, what words did you learn for genitals? And, and, you know, people hear things like, you know, they're no, no bits and they're naughty parts. And, you know, it might sound cute, um, but at what point is that supposed to deprogram? Like when people turn 18, suddenly that is a great part of their body. Um, and that is of course not how it works. So we have to spend a lot of effort sort of deprogramming those messages. Wow, great. Um, <laughs> A lot to unpack there. Uh, panel, does anybody feel like uh, carrying on with any of the points that, that Stella brought up? Yeah, I feel like I've had this conversation with somebody before uh, regarding where does sex and shame originate from? I know Stella, you just touched on that a little bit and I wish I could remember who I was talking to, but I think ultimately we were like, the Protestants. <laughs> um, and just like, you know, does it go back as far as that, like based in the in the religion that pleasure is uh, somehow negative or, yeah. and I hate to turn this into a religious conversation, but I think that it, maybe it does play a part in it. Um, you know, does it stem from that? And then culturally that just sort of morphed into this thing where like sex, sex is shameful. And then, uh, you know, but then we're all like, but but it feels so good. And then that adds another message of like, you're not supposed to feel good because that's selfish and that's bad. It's just this whole thing. But I think if we can kind of figure out at least for each individual where it stems from, uh, for me, that really helped not just like my childhood was this way because I had a very open childhood. I grew up in Germany, which is a very sex positive place to be. And I don't necessarily have a lot of shame around sex. I talk very openly about it. Um, but I do have other types of shame, uh, body image, for instance, or, uh, well, let's just leave it at that one. But, um, but I think for me, the concept of like, thinking, oh, okay, maybe it was a Protestant thing, for instance, or just something really big and not necessarily personal to me helps, uh, I think helps in healing if we know where it came from. So curious as to anyone else's thoughts regarding that. Yeah. Um, oh, no, you can go. You started talking. <laughs> um, it's funny because as a sex therapist, that's one of the main things that I often work with clients about is looking at the ways in which uh, we internalize shame, right? Like I often talk to people about, you know, I approach therapy from um, kind of a sociological or uh, systems approach. And what I often tell them is that much of our internal experience is a response to external cultural values, institutions, and power dynamics. Um, one that I always think about is the fact that so much of sexuality is actually, we're really talking about gendered expectations and how when we think we're talking about sex, we're often really talking about um, what's allowed around uh, ideas of who gets to do what based on gender and the power dynamics that come with that which kind of comes back to that piece around uh, different religions and, and how sexuality has a double standard based on uh, social location. Lola, you were about to say something as well. Can you add on to yeah, that? Yeah, I, I just, along the lines of, I kind of break it down to people, a shame is what we feel is inappropriate and what we feel is appropriate. And so if you feel like you're doing something you've been told is inappropriate and wrong, then that's one point where shame comes in. It's also caring what people think. So a, a lot of the roads to get away from shame is not caring what people think about what you do and the choices that you make, um, realizing those things aren't important. And then also 
rewiring what we think is appropriate and inappropriate. And some of that is like for me being a part of the sex positive community and like my journey through learning things and like, oh, that's not weird. It's just different. And so it's like, oh yeah. And so now for me, I'm just, when people tell me things and they're like, oh, this is spicy. I'm like, no, it's not, it's not that spicy. <laughs> There's a lot, no, you're normal. Like I get that all the time. People think that they're going to tell me the most abnormal, wildest thing. And I'm like, yeah, pretty run in the mill. Good. I'm curious if you could either say a little more about that or if anybody would be comfortable um, I, I want everybody to, of course, stay at their own comfort level. But I feel like we've been talking about generalities a lot. Um, you know, like people feel shame in this way or this way about this. Would anybody feel comfortable sharing something that they have perhaps felt shameful about in the past that has been eroded? Again, it doesn't have to be like that snap gone away moment. Um, and, and if not, no problem. Um, oh, but Stella, you have your, your hand raised, please. Yeah, well, I mean, it's sort of, my personal story would add to what I was thinking uh, when Lola was talking is, I mean, the one, number one tool for combating shame is bringing things out of the darkness, talking about it. So like Lola was saying, like somebody sharing a story with her about their thing and her being able to like validate it and reflect back, like that's normal, that's great. Everyone wants to hear that they're normal and okay. And, um, you know, I actually give Mystery Box Show as homework to a lot of my clients because hearing people talk about this is so powerful in combating shame and people hearing their own stories reflected. Um, and the thing for me that was huge, you know, around, you know, body shame was again, show the thing that you feel uncomfortable about. I just started getting naked a lot more. Um, you know, in college, I was invited to um, these like naked co-ed, you know, hot tubbing places up in Portland. I started doing nude modeling. Um, and that was huge for me and just sort of putting it in someone else's hands. Like, okay, well, the photographer wants to put it out there. And so that's letting them validate that or letting the audience validate that. Um, and then the storytelling piece, you know, getting on stage for Mystery Box has, it's not therapy, but it has felt therapeutic because I get up there and say my stuff that I feel shame about or embarrassed about and then you know, the audience hoot and hollers about it and cries about it and hugs you later. Um, and I think that's how we can all move through it together. I 100% I agree, especially about the, the storytelling piece. And we've seen that happen over and over with people who, who, who have heard stories and said, you know, like I, I, I thought I was so strange or so unique. Uh, and then hearing somebody talk about basically me up on stage uh, showed me that Oh, that, that I am not, um, and I, and and I think that goes a lot towards feeling um, feeling not alone. But Matthew, I, I remember something you and I were talking about with shame once, and I, this might have even been in the story you told earlier this year uh, about I think it was Brene Brown's difference between guilt and shame. Um, it, yeah, I always like. My quick definition is uh, guilt is I've done something bad. Shame is I am bad, right? Like shame is usually this global sense of wrongness. And I think Dirty uh, Lola said it beautifully. Um, culturally, we often define sex as appropriate or not appropriate or acceptable versus unacceptable. And that's not only this kind of uh, binary thinking, this black and white thinking, but either you're doing it right or it's totally wrong. And that's completely shameful uh, versus, ooh, that didn't work for me. How do I get curious around that and have it work for me? And so I always think moving from acceptable to unacceptable to is it consensual and is it pleasurable? I think those are great standards to use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And can I, can I ask is, I wonder if there's anything involved with sort of the receivership. Do you find that people often get over shame by themselves individually, or does it often take people around them? I think um, kind of again with that Benet Brown idea that vulnerability is kind of the antidote to shame, right? And Stella said it beautifully with, when we talk about it, we live in a culture that tells us 
we have to be super sexy, but don't you dare talk about it, right? Like if you talk about it, it somehow takes the magic of sex or the sexy out of it. And so I have a lot of clients that want something, but they don't want to have to describe it or ask for it because that somehow takes the mystique away. And yeah, so I find when people start talking about it and they're vulnerable, most often someone will be like, oh my God, yes, that is exactly what happened to me. Or, oh my gosh, that is so awkward for me too. Um, I always joke Americans were taught to be super sexy, but we don't, um, or we're taught to be sexy, don't actually talk about it. And that's why so many Americans, their first sexual experiences are super awkward and usually not um, really that great. That makes me think that Reba, you might have something to contribute there if I can, <laughs> if I can raise your hand for you. That makes you think that about me? <laughs> In what regard? I was going to say something, but now I'm like, what do you think I was going to say? <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I don't mean to, to, to call you out. In the regard that Matthew was saying that Americans are, are, are told be sexy, but also it's super shameful and like that Americans first sexual experiences tend to be awkward. And I know you often talk a little bit about how you were raised uh, shaping the way you see sex. Right, because I, uh, so I grew up in a military family, and so my early childhood was in uh, in uh, Kaiserslautern, uh, Ramstein, on Ramstein Air Force Base in Germany, uh, which is very just sexually open, and um, I don't want to necessarily credit my parents. <laughs> Uh, my parents were very neutral around it, I guess. They never said like, yes, do the sex or no, don't do the sex. It was just very neutral. But my surroundings, my peers, my teachers, even I give this example, the German version of Sesame Street. Well, it was Sesame Street itself, but there was a, a different opening. The opening credits were different. And it was uh, little naked children running around a fountain. Um, where in like America, you would not see naked children <laughs> on TV at all. That would be like criminal um, or you know, if we went to like a public swimming pool, it was always clothing optional. Like that was the default. Um, if you went to a pool where you had to wear a swimsuit, that was abnormal. And so that just sort of was ingrained in me of like, that's just how it is. And that probably has a lot to do with uh, me being open. Uh, but with that being said, that's not like a, a cure all or anything like that. What I was going to say prior to that, Eric, is that I do remember a specific like shameful time in my early 20s um, where I was still figuring out who I was sexually. Um, I know now that I identify as a kinky person and I didn't know that that's really what that was back then. Um, and I wasn't even doing, I was with a partner um, and I was just doing something silly. I call it, I'll call it like acrobatic, if you will. Um, I think I was lying on my back, but I was kind of like my head was off the bed and I was almost prob I was probably touching the ground, the floor actually with my hands. I was just in a contort, I was like a contortionist. Um, and I was like, this, this is hot to me. Like, let's have sex this way. And my partner just like looked at me and said, uh, that's weird. And that just put a kibosh on the whole thing. And I was like, oh, I, he said, that's weird. But I translated that to I'm weird. Um, and so sex wasn't that great after that because I was too scared to ask for anything or suggest anything ever again. And so I know we've talked here about um, talking about our interests and having people validate them, like an audience can validate you, your therapist can validate you, et cetera. But I also want to, um, I don't know, not discount that our partners can help you erase that shame as well, because, um, you know, it was through having partners after that who were open to sort of kinky things or who were kinky themselves or who, um, maybe ask for something that I wasn't into. And then that challenged me to ask myself, well, is that something they should be ashamed of just because I don't like it? Um, obviously the answer is no, but it gave me the opportunity to sort of ask myself those questions. Um, and I think eventually I just, having great partners who have open communication, I think really helps with the shame. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. that's. It makes it, it makes me wonder about about different countries' uh, relationships with 
how they how they think about sex. And, you know, obviously America can't be the only one with <laughs> with issues. Um, but I'm also curious. So so everything you said, Reba, makes me think, and I want I want to throw this to everybody with either clients you've worked with or people you've educated. Um, I think we have seen a how do I want to say a a a a normalization a uh, a normalization of kinky stuff uh, as as being part of sex at least as part of the conversation in the past couple of decades and I'm I'm sure that that's you know you can trace that back going further and further I've heard that uh, you know in the 60s a blowjob was like the height of kink and now it's sort of almost like the base entry level um, but as stuff has become more and more normalized. Uh, I'll get a little bit personal here. As somebody who identifies as, as pretty non-kinky and vanilla, I've heard that people have experienced almost a backlash of, of vanilla shame, like like something's wrong with me if I'm not kinky. And, and Matthew, that sort of speaks to, I think, what you were talking about, that, you know, that, that it is a spectrum, that a lot of people treat sex as either you do it this way and it's good, or you do it this way and you're you're no good. Um, so I'm curious if any of you have experienced that kind of spectrum of people dealing with that over the over, over seeing kink become more more normalized. I've heard that from clients and and in classes. I've had clients in my office basically apologize to me, like, sorry, I'm not poly or sorry, I'm not kinky, as though I am like personally invested in what kind of sex they are gonna have. Um, I've had it come up in college classes when I'm doing kink 101 that people think vanilla is like a derogatory term now. Um, and I've started prefacing classes now with that discussion. I just taught kink 101 for Shebop online and sort of prefaced saying it's, I don't, at least I don't think it's about being better or worse. I think it's important that everybody has all the options. They know all of the relationship structures they could have. They know that there are different kinds of sex available and then they should choose whatever the heck they want. And as long as they're enjoying it, the other people involved are enjoying it. That's great. But yeah, I do think we're sort of seeing that reversal as though you are, there's something wrong with you if you're not doing all of the things. That's super fascinating to me. And I'm, and, and I'm glad that that's coming up more and more in classes. Cause I, I felt like um, for people who, who are feeling that way, there's, uh, it feels like there's a limited way of tell of a let's say of, of telling a person it's okay if you're vanilla or it's, it's okay if you're not kinky or you're not poly without sounding condescending without you know <laughs> so it's it, it's awesome that you're able to do that in a way that really communicates compassion and and spectrum and that everybody's sex positivity is their own uh, or i'm i'm not sure i I'm saying that correctly. Yeah. And I think it's important to note too that people are multifaceted. I know, Stella, I've taken a number of your classes and I think I've heard you say a number of times, I have vanilla sex all the time. What? <laughs> um, because like that's the thing, right? Like sometimes you you don't have to identify as kinky, as vanilla, as polyamorous, as non-monogamous. Like the labeling, I know it helps to have labels to to help talk about things. Um, but I think we all think that we sexually have to have a label too, um, as part of, I see Lola shaking your head. <laughs> Do you have some feelings? <laughs> I get more of the, I, I feel like there's a lot of people, I get the violent side maybe. It, maybe violence a harsh word, but I have a lot of people that get very angry that I'm talking about polyamory. I had somebody yell at me at a live show because I had a guest on who's, I had Kevin Patterson, poly, poly person. Ooh. And we were talking about poly, polyamory and she stood up and was like, well, why aren't you talking about monogamy? And I'm like, cause you do monogamy every day, all day. Everybody talks about monogamy. Tissue commercials talk about monogamy. Today, you don't get to hear about monogamy. Sit down or you can leave. And she was like angry that I wouldn't baby her. And I'm like, I'm not coddling you because you shouldn't have to be told you count because the world tells you that you count. And people like kinky folk and poly folk are finally getting to a place where we see ourselves on TV, we're seeing ourselves in books that are sold at 
mainstream bookstores, like even if they're sh written in a very shitty way, um, <laughs> we're seeing we're seeing like ourselves and they're and and like because people who are vanilla and and monogamous a lot of times have such a disconnect from their sexuality they don't realize how much the world actually revolves around them there are no hallmark movies with polyamorous people in them it is aggressively monogamous and every christmas we get aggressive monogamy. You should give up your job in the city and fall in love with that boy on the farm who you were in love with when you were 12 and you didn't know you wanted to be with him and your grandma is sick and she's leaving her your farm and you're gonna give up your life to be with this boy and you're gonna get married even though you only kissed one time. That's how aggressive monogamy is, but people want you to like still coddle them. And it's like, I refuse, you know, like when, when we're getting equal airtime, maybe but maybe connect with your sexuality a little bit more and you would look around and go, oh yeah, you're always talking about my stuff. I mean, like even Cosmo, Cosmo, I never thought those things were kinky. It was just how to make, it was like spicy. It was like a vanilla with a little cinnamon in it. It was never, <laughs> there was nothing, like even in high school, I was like, this is not kinky. This, some of this is dangerous, but it's not kinky. <laughs> it's, not, it's not kinky. And so I think, I, I, I just want people to realize it's like, you're not wrong because you're everywhere. And if you were wrong, you wouldn't be anywhere. Like that's the message we're getting is that we're wrong. So we don't get to be anywhere. Like we have to really push to be seen and to be part of the mainstream. And, and it's like, we can all coexist, but there's gonna be some times where you feel like things are a little bit more, people are talking about more, cause it's exciting, right? Like even if you're not kinky, so many housewives read 50 Shades of Grey and then didn't do anything. You know, like there's nobody, nobody painted a room red, nobody went and bought them love all. <laughs> but it was just a spicy moment where you're like, oh, there's things in the world that exist that I'm just not gonna do, but they're there. <laughs> Yeah. I, so some I, something I I would say is another word for shame is normal. Anytime yeah. you hear the word normal, think shame because yeah. that's actually what that I would argue that word means. Um, and what I mean by that is there is no such thing as normal sex. There is no such thing. Um, what we think is normal would be absurd in other cultures. In fact, what um, Dirty Lola was talking about. More times than not, when someone says normal, what they mean is normative. Because for example, the most normal, statistically speaking, the most average experience is polygyny. Uh, the first five books of the Bible, all polygynous families. Uh, every culture has practiced polygyny. Um, it is practiced historically. So if we're gonna use the word normal uh, as the most common human experience around um, ways to create uh, connection and family, that would be the most normal. But I always like to think the word normal is a sneaky hidden way of saying shame. Mm -hmm. I have a question from our audience tonight. Um, one of our lovely contributors, I think I can show it here. Let me try doing this. Um, there we go. So Adam asked earlier if shame ever fills a positive function, which I think is a really interesting question. And it personally reminded me of what Dirty Lola started with of associating shame with what we think of as being inappropriate versus appropriate. I think shame can help you grow. I mean, it's kind of like a marker, right? It's, um, I tell the story all the time about when I started um, out in kink and my first dom required me to send photos and the first picture, like nude photos. And the first picture I ever sent, like I was in tears. It took me forever to like take it. And he's like, why are you crying? And I'm like, oh, like you want to see this? And he's like, I wouldn't ask you if I didn't want to see it. And like the, for the forcing me to do it and to look at it. But by the end of our time together, I was able to send photos and I, I could see myself as beautiful without having any shame. So it was almost like this marker of growth of this is where I was and here's where I am. So I think that's a thing. I think also it can be one of those things are like, hmm, maybe this is a thing I need to work on 
you know, when you, when it, when that stuff bubbles up, because I think even really open people have our shame moments. I'm trying to, I can't think of, <laughs> I'm not even, I'm just like, what was the last thing I was ashamed of? It's been a long time. Um, but when it, when it does bubble up, uh, that like, it'll, it, it will be a thing. I think I've had, um, oh, I've had some shame about submission. And if that makes me a bad feminist and and if that makes me not as much of a feminist as I thought I was and am. Um, and but that just meant like, oh, I just need to do some work for me. Like that's that's what those things it triggers this. I'm going to go read some books and read some articles and parse it through for myself. So I think it can be healthy in that way if you use it as a tool to to dig in and make it better. That is a powerful ending note. Um, I, th I think we could continue talking about this for a long, long time, um, but it, it, it is time to move on. So thank you for all uh, contributing to that conversation. Um, by the way, if, if everybody doesn't know who's, who's watching this, uh, because there was so much uh, unpacked there, uh, you can replay uh, this, this live stream once, once we've finished. It'll be on YouTube and you can go back and replay it and you know, take notes um, because I feel, I feel like it's, it, this kind of in-depth discussion deserves that. Um, before we move on, I wanna take a moment to, uh, to thank our sponsor tonight. Uh, and our sponsor is the fantastic Shebop. Um, Shebop is a women-owned sex toy boutique here in Portland, Oregon. And if you need anything to do with your sex life, uh, from body safe products to education, they're honestly the place to go. Uh, Oregon just got put in a freeze so that, uh, for, for businesses. So curbside pickup is on a halt for the moment, but they are currently offering free shipping on orders over $75 with the code free ship. And you can go to shebopthashop.com uh, you can see that down there in the uh, in down below where I'm talking, um, and you should you should also definitely check out their online classes uh, coming up. They have on December 6 burlesque for the holidays with Eva Delicious of the Showgirl Temple on December 8th. Uh, they're having what they call a sex ed quickie warm up with wax play. December 13th, BJ's with AJ, a fellatio workshop. That's with Emery Jane. She's another dear friend of ours. And of course, coming up very soon on December 2nd, none other than Stella Harris teaching G-spot and squirting orgasms. So you can check that all out on uh, on Shebop, uh, shebopthashop.com. And again, that link is below in the, uh, in, in the video description. So thank you to Shebop for... Um, for sponsoring tonight's live stream. And with that, I wanna move on to our next topic, which was actually inspired by, uh, I don't know if any of you have seen on YouTube, we have what we call these confession corners uh, where we take confessions from our audience based on a prompt and then we read them out loud. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but one of the recent ones inspired this conversation about the difference between uh, a person being fetishized and objectified and whether that's ever okay, or if it's never okay, or if there's context. And Reba actually speaks about this a lot more uh, eloquently <clears throat> and with a lot more um, authority than I ever do. So Reba, I was, um, I was hoping you would feel comfortable starting this conversation off. Uh, can I bring you on screen to, uh, to, to start off, what are your thoughts on, let's start with objectification. How would you define that? And what are your feelings on how that's applied to you in your life? Um, well, this is interesting. I'm not sure if the dictionary definition of objectification is the same as the way I take it. So um, I'm guessing the definition of objectification is treating someone like an object, like they're not a person in a sexual way. Um, you know, you're just a sex toy for me, for instance. Um, I, however, receive objectification as your outward appearance is turning me on and that's hot. <laughs> so I'm a person who likes to be objectified, for instance, and we were talking earlier about um, objectification having a negative connotation tied to it. Um, and I think that it has a lot to do with the intention 
as well. If there is a disrespectful intention, that feels like a negative objectification to me. If it has a good intention behind it, and I know uh, that is uh, good is, uh, what am I trying to say? The word is escaping me, but it's personal. Um, if, if someone's intention is good or not, what feels good to you or, or not. Is that what you were wanting an answer to? I think it was, yeah. I think that's I think that's a great place to start off with objectification. And since we're obviously context matters a great deal, um, and since we're going to try to contrast that with fetish, fetishization, um, I think it'd be also helpful to get uh, to, to get a, dif uh, a definition of the difference between, let's say, having a fetish or fetishizing a person. And I'm curious if anybody would like to volunteer to take on that definition, uh, that 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 large responsibility of defining a fetish or fetishization. Who? Okay, I'll try. I'll try. Okay. Um, Lola, you're up. <laughs> so, I mean, my understanding with fetishization is there is a sexual but not always sex uh, component of, 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 of it's the trigger that helps someone reach a state of arousal or a state of being turned on or a state of just complete like oh they they need it they love it um where and and it has to and when people have a fetish it needs to be a part of what's happening for them sexually like this is this is the their thing um so I've always looked at fetishization as more of, it involves a lot more conversation and consent and, and whatnot. I mean, uh, then other, and especially if it's of a person, if you don't have that, then that's just stalking. Um, so you have to have more of a, more a back and forth. And then like what Reba was saying about objectification it is that you're treating someone like an object. I think why it gets a rap, bad rap is because there usually isn't a conversation about it. It usually is someone just thinking of you as a means to an end. It's not, and also fetish is very specific and personal. Objectification could be anything. So you are a means to an end. And if you are not going to be that means to an end, then somebody else will. Whereas with a fetish, it is very specific and it needs to be. So if you have a fetish for, of a, for whatever reason, for a particular person or there's something about them, that is a very specific thing you are after and some, somebody else will not do. And those are, those are the things that kind of divide it is I think, and I do think you can have objectification as part of a consensual experience, but I think in general, how it's used out in the world, out in the wild, is that it's, you know, you're either good face, good tits, good legs, great ass, like you're, you're, you're pieces, you're not a whole. Matthew, I see you, sh you, you nodding your head. Uh, mm -hmm. Is this something that you've encountered with your clients or with couples that you work with? Yeah. Well, I think of objectification in the kind of the cultural political sense of dehumanizing, particularly women, but we can dehumanize anyone to kind of focus on what we need them to be for us. And so it takes away their uh, subjectivity, their ability to participate in that process. Um, and fetishes is, uh, Dirty Lola did a great job defining that, that it, it, it really is a uh, taking a specific, um, usually non-living, um, uh, thing or part of a person that's non-genital and um, sexualizing it. And it is a deep and important part of the sexual process. Um, I mean, in a strict um, clinical sense, it's you have to have it there to uh, be able to experience sexual pleasure. But the truth is, is um, generally everybody has um, different fetishes. It's a very common experience. In fact, I sometimes like to point out um, we fetishize normalcy. So a lot of people are really, really focused on being normal and can't enjoy sex unless they think they're having normal sex. And so I always think that's kind of an interesting way of thinking about fetishizing um, specific acts, things, or 
parts of the body. That's such an interesting tie back into what we were saying about shame as mm -hmm. I'd never even considered that before. So just to, 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 to reiterate, you some of your clients encounter difficulty basically performing sex because of the anxiety of whether something is weird, whether whether they're experiencing shame about it. Is that accurate? In, in fact, I would say it's probably one of the most common ways that people struggle is they don't allow themselves to enjoy sex unless they're having the sex that for their group or culture is dubbed uh, acceptable and normal. So a lot of people will not have sex unless it's at night in bed with the lights off um, in missionary position. Anything outside of that uh, induces anxiety or it doesn't feel safe enough to get back into their body and kind of enjoy it. So normal, it's probably the most common fetish. Yeah. <laughs> If I could, um, Eric mentioned earlier that this stemmed from a conversation that he and I had over one of our Confession Corner videos. So, and I think we're, I want to bring that into it for a moment and ask you all about this. Um, the confession that came in, I'm summarizing this, was that um, a hetero couple was married and then the, uh, the husband came out as as trans, as a woman, um, and the wife confessed. Uh, the confession was something I didn't know I was into, but turns out I am. Um, and the wife was like, wow, uh, I had no idea that I was attracted to trans women um, now that my husband is a woman, now that my wife is a wife, uh, my husband is a wife, I am now in a lesbian relationship and I couldn't be happier. Um, and we were like, that's amazing. That's not often the story that you hear. That's great. And um, Eric brought up before we filmed it, he was like, ooh, is that fetishizing trans people? Should we not read this one on air? And I was like, how is it fetishizing trans people to say like, I didn't know um, the way that I compared it. So this is the, the real question, the difference between fetishizing, objectifying, and also just preference. Um, what I had said to him was, well, what is this then? For instance, I'll use myself. I am attracted to cis men who cross-dress. I don't have to have that in order to have a good sexual experience. Um, so I don't consider that a fetish. I also don't, is it objectifying? I mean, if there's a lineup of cross-dressing men in front of me, I'm not necessarily going to be attracted to every single one of them because I also am going to have to be attracted to their personality if we're going to have a sexual experience together. But is that a preference or is it just something I'm attracted to? Or if I said to that person, I am, <laughs> I am attracted to you and left it at that, would they be thinking what it's because I'm wearing a dress and I'm male identified and I'm a you know, cis man, would they feel fetishized? It was just very confusing to me. It's all jumbled. And so therefore is fetishization, like we, I think that has a very negative connotation. You don't want to fetishize someone. You don't want to fetishize someone. Um, but is it this, always negative? I, I, think, I think this speaks a lot to what Lola was saying about there usually needs to be a conversation involved. So I, I guess the, the natural question off of that is, if you are finding yourself attracted to somebody in a way that you think might be fetishizing them, how, what would be a way that somebody could begin that conversation that would feel comfortable? Is that something that you've experienced um, with people that you've worked with or in any of your classes? I is there a comfortable way to start yeah. that conversation? I mean, this is, this lands in that heap of like, the conversation we have about preference and you know oh it's not bad to have preferences yes it is it is if you can't dismantle that you are not into black people because that's white supremacy in action that's a problem like we all have preferences and those preferences are colored by things that are not good so i think when it comes to our fetishization i think it it's and then I think it's also maybe not even calling it that because the question is, if you are into someone, 
when they look a certain way, are you not into them when they don't look that way? Like if if they're not in the dress or you're no longer going to be into that person, that's where you get into a harmful space and a space that's not good for the person that you're into because then they, it's like they feel like they are, have to be a certain way in order to get your love, care and acceptance. Um, or if you can't be attracted to them unless they look a certain way, that's where we start hedging into issues. Um, and I think that goes across like so many things. You have women who, um, I mean, my hair, I cut my hair and my husband fell out of love with me. That's a true story. That was a direct quote from him when he asked for a divorce is when I shaved my head, he no longer was in love with me because my hair, he doesn't like the hair that I had on my head naturally. And so it was like, oh, that's awful. <laughs> that's fucking awful. That's something you need to break down as to why. That's not a me problem. That's a you problem. But it is hurtful to people. And it and it does cause people to act certain ways within relationships. And it and it and it also is this thing where you end up with partners who feel very hurt if you do something different. Like you go get a haircut and they act like you stab them in the face. Or or like you're so wrong because you decided you don't want to wear pants anymore. I don't know. You know, there's there's so many things that we we don't think about. But if it's I think that's where you have to stop and think. I think it's okay to say I really love when you are in a dress and I love like I mean, who doesn't like a man with a beard and a like banging ass dress? I yeah, I'm, I'm that's in that what I'm talking about. Yeah. Like, <laughs> TikTok has got me like, oh, y'all need to stop. This is too much. <laughs> but it's it's like I to say I love this, but I also love it when you're not in a dress. Like I love you in jeans and whatever. This is just the thing that like really takes my box. If you want to, if we want to get into like a, a good spicy area, like this is the thing that's going to get me there. But I like you in other places. So I think that's a good conversation to have. And at the, uh, I think it's more about conversation with yourself too, is, is this a thing I should say out loud? I had that conversation with someone today that there are certain things that we shouldn't say to other people. Like there's just things that it, it's going to be hurtful. You should keep to yourself and work through it. And and it's some things we don't need to say out loud because it's a uh, once you open that box and you let that cat out, it's not easy to get it back in. It's just going to be a whole other thing. Yeah. Matthew, I, I see think, you. Oh, go ahead, Reba. I was going to say I think uh, what you said about uh, Lola. Um, what really resonated with me is um, as I said, like I don't have to have this thing. Um, what you said, I think, was like. Yeah, you can't, you're not attracted to that person unless they are this certain way. That's mm -hmm. the fetishiz fetishization. Is that what I'm hearing? Is yes. Kind of like, yeah. yeah. So that's, yeah. that was explained in a way that I had not, hadn't heard before. So I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Uh, yeah. Definition. I also, yeah, I think building, <laughs> building off of that, I think the key thing is to not treat preferences or sexual tastes as innate or essential. They all, all our preferences, all our tastes are cultivated through our lived experiences. So when we say I have a preference, that's just who I am, that just completely avoids the kind of unpacking or taking responsibility for how that preference or taste impacts. It's all about that collaborative kind of honesty, vulnerability, transparency, so that you can actually invite someone to participate. Because um, again, in white supremacist culture, we often are taught objective truth, uh, sexuality is essential, so that I just am the way I am, and that leaves all these really terrible power structures unquestioned. Mm -hmm. So, you know, men naturally objectify. Uh-uh, uh-uh, right? Like humans can objectify, but there is no, you know, nobody gets to corner the market on that. Yes, please, Stella, we haven't heard from you yet. <laughs> well, I was, everyone's been so smart. I've actually been taking notes. Like, even though I'm in this panel, I'm like, oh, good, y'all, I'm writing this down. Um, but there was a, a good test for this. I actually um, was recently interviewing Kevin Patterson for my upcoming book, and we had this conversation, and he summed this up in a couple of, of great sound bites because we were talking about fetishization and partner choice. And he said, kind of the test for, like, is it about what the person is or who the person is? And a test for that is, well, what do you know about them? 
So if you are walking up to the guy in a dress across the room and that's all you know about them, like that test for yourself is maybe you have the conversation and see if you also like them as a person. Like we are all, you know, at least a little bit superficial and we're all drawn by attraction. So of course we're gonna walk across the room to talk to the person we think is hot. Um, but that's when that other interrogation piece comes in. Like, why do we think they're hot? You know, what, it, are we still gonna be able to see them as a whole person? Do we care, you know, what their favorite movie is? Do we want the whole conversation or are we just ask them to bring that one, you know, physical feature that we saw from across the room? So I thought that was a great sort of test from him if you wanna sort of interrogate your desires a little bit. Uh, Matthew, I see you nodding again. Did you want to respond? No, no, I just, I thought that was great. He's got a whole chapter about that. If anyone who's listening is curious about that in the book, Love's Not Colorblind, there's a whole chapter about like dating preferences um, that sort of unpacks some of that, how we think, oh, I just like whatever. Um, but I've seen this in my office too. Like, oh, you only like skinny white blonde women. Like, where do you think that came from? You know, that's like, I don't know. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of work to do. I'm curious, I, with couples that you've seen, or, or let's just say particular people, um, how do I wanna phrase this so I don't get myself in trouble? Or should I just risk getting myself in trouble? Um, Let's go for it. <laughs> Let's say let's say you met somebody and their dating history was exclusively skinny white uh, skinny white blonde woman women. Um, at what point do you chalk that up to either coincidence or at what point does that become problematic? Is is it basic? Can we apply that Kevin Patterson test? It's day say, one. Mm -mm. I asked the question. <laughs> I, I do if if i oh no i'm fat i'm a fat black woman this is not a day for you to i'm not your experiment we have that question and usually they'll out themselves you're the first blah 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 and it's like oh what does that mean like you know what what and if they can articulate and i've had somebody go like no you're really interesting and they said all the right things and along with the like but you're the first person so i'm like okay that felt like you're giving me a, the, you're trying to move beyond what you normally gravitate towards and are open to new things versus the, um, I saw your boobs and yeah, you're fat, but <laughs> like, I saw your boobs. And so I'm, I'm into you. I, I just have that conversation up, up front. And, and I mean, it also depends what you want. Cause if I'm just having sex with them, I don't care. I'm using them for sex. It's, if this is what we're doing, that's what we're doing. I'm not going to talk to them later anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> but if if it's a relate, like a, I'm like I'm gearing towards something, a relationship or whatever, then yeah, those things matter because I don't I don't want to be I don't like being people's experiments. I don't want to be, and that goes for like any of my identities. Like I'm, um, I say that to people. I'll, I'll date people that are new to poly, but not if you're gonna if you're not sure about what you're doing because that I don't want to be the person that you try it out on and then decide to go back to monogamy like that's not where I, where I want to be I mean there are people in the world who might want that I don't want that so yeah I think it's yeah we the, those questions and I think it's also again people don't talk to themselves enough I talk to myself all the time in the kitchen about I do during quarantine I've had so many good conversations about like how my romantic attachments to women and am I still allowed to call myself, you know, queer? And it's like, yes, yes. And like how I've fallen in love with women, but I'm not necessarily sexually attracted to all the women, but I like want to be their girlfriend and hold their hands and make out with them. And and there's these things but people don't do that enough. Or to, And when we talk about who we're attracted to, it's like, I don't know. I won't call myself pan because I don't know. And I'm, I'm not gonna pretend I know. But once I've, even if you happen upon like that one person that doesn't fit in your box, like that's why I don't say I'm bi anymore. I had too many people that didn't fit in that binary. And so I had to like move away from it and and 
you know, but I think you're allowed, there are things you're allowed, like I love people that are masculine of center, whatever your genders, your genitals are, that doesn't matter. But if you have a beard, baby, <laughs> I'm yours. <laughs> you know, so I think there are things that we are allowed to say like, oof, this is what turns me on. But like my main partner of three years doesn't have a beard, you know, like it's not, he's, you know, he doesn't look like the people that I'm currently lusting after. So I think that's a being open, having those things. You can like your men in beard with beards and dresses, but also being open to what else might fall in your lap. Yeah. Wow. And I'm, I would I'm say- I'm keeping an eye on the, oh, please Matthew. I would say there are no coincidences. That's also a sneaky way of hiding the fact that we choose. And as a mm-hmm. sociologist, like we say love is blind, but it is deeply patterned and I can predict within relative accuracy who you're gonna choose because we choose based on you know our preferences and those preferences are predicated on cultural expectation, norms, power dynamics, but there are no coincidences. We are very good at creating patterns. Yep. I want to backtrack like a- just for a second though, before we do that, I know we just talked, we sort of like, uh, insulted skinny blonde white women i just wanted to add i think we were using that as a symbol for everyone who's listening a a symbol that means a certain stereotype so if you are indeed a skinny white blonde woman you're still valid and attractive doesn't mean you're bad (laughs) completely you're absolutely right reba and that is uh that is my mistake for uh for for underlining and highlighting that Of, of of course whoever you are you are valid and um we were stereotyping uh, without um, without consideration for that. Apologies. More like a symbol, um, though. That is a symbol. So yeah, yeah. I think it's fair to say it kind of represents what gets culturally celebrated in a white supremacist culture, right? Like that yeah. is the image that gets um, sold the most and shown the most in media. Yeah. I did want to say I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the time here, and it's just about time for us to wrap up this section. And once again, it, it feels like we could have an entire evening full of this. I was wondering if there were any final thoughts anybody had to offer, or Nicole, were there any uh, questions coming in regarding this for any of the panelists regarding this topic? Uh, Nicole, I think you're muted. I. Sure was. There we go. Um, I There were a couple of different conversations that I sort of summarized reading in the comments. Um, people responding from what you all were saying, uh, where it sounds like some of these conversations are around context, right? And it sounds like the context that you have maybe with the partner that you're with or with the person that you're with. Um, and one person specifically asked or compared it, I guess, to sort of coming on to someone Um, or like a pickup line that might seem well-intentioned on their end or like even validating, but then from the person receiving it, it could be offensive or or ill-received. So sort of walking that line of objectification and validation, um, which I think I heard Dirty Lola kind of comment on earlier with the like, (laughs) when you should keep it inside of your head. I don't know if there are thoughts along those lines, sort of what those lines are between starting a conversation and um, validation and then when it goes into something else. I think you, I mean, (laughs) it's just so exhausting because when you have, I have these conversations with the internet and I say the internet because it's sometimes the pushback that you get Mm -hmm. is just like, oh, the internet. But it's a thing where people, we've been so conditioned to like congratulate people who lose weight um, or to tell somebody they look uh-huh. great if they ha- if they have on makeup. And we, and you know, like we never tell anybody in their sweats without makeup that they look nice. And so there's these things, but that we don't know what people are going through. So if somebody lost weight, but they're sick or they have an eating disorder or there's just like some things you don't know what's behind that. So it's like trying to just, for me, I always try to move through the world in a way that doesn't assume that people want these compliments. Like I try to, I don't compliment people's bodies. I will compliment your outfit. 
um, your shade of lipstick, uh, your shoes, like things that are not, don't have to do with your physical presence. But I think a lot of people don't do that. And they think that they're being kind, but it's like, I don't want to hear that you think I'm pretty for a fat girl. That's not a compliment, yo. Like, and I get that a lot. Um, you're really articulate for a black person. No, please don't say that. That's awful. That it's 2020, you're going to get slapped. <laughs> it's not going to be a thing. So though, and it's rethinking why we think things are compliments and mm -hmm. why, and why do we think we need to project that on, on people? Like, why do we think, is that going to win us anything if we're giving those things to someone? I personally, if you come over and you tell me it's a great dress, I, you're going to go way farther with me than if you tell me I'm pretty. Um, usually I'll go, it has pockets. <laughs> and then I do the, it has pockets swing that we all do when, when a dress has pockets. But if you, if you notice like my fashion sense over what I look like or, or, of that nature, mm -hmm. I'm more prone to be in your camp than than if you're just like, oh, you're pretty. Okay, <laughs> sure, 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 sure. So yeah, it's just think about. It's not always what we think is polite. It might be like that we have to rethink those things because where does that come from? It's yeah, yeah. It's so helpful when it's like you say, like it's about a choice that you made. Like your dress is a choice that you made. The lipstick you're wearing is a choice that you made. Like the shape of your body. I mean, maybe someone like, you know, chose to do things to their body, but like it is so much better to interact with like someone's style, like intentionally ways they're putting themselves in their world rather than just like their innate features that they have no control over or limited control over. Right. And it's more likely to get you in trouble. Right. And if you know them, that's different. Like my friend, people tell me I have great tits. That, and it's usually people who, who know me, like my friends will come, but they know that I like my boobs. Like, it's okay. This is an area it's okay for us to talk about. And we openly talk about my boobs. But if a stranger said something, I'd be like, hmm, I really <laughs> get out of here. You know, so it's, it's familiarity, you know, like what, and that almost feels like a good example of, of if a stranger said they liked your boobs, that to me feels like a negative type of objectification. But if your BFF says to you, you got great tits, that feels like a positive objectification. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, and my, my friend goes, you have the Mona Lisa of tits. And I'm like, I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. Right. But I don't want somebody who doesn't know me at all to like run up and that's not the thing. I will accept drunk girls in bars telling me I have nice. <laughs> that that's when the line's a little bit blurred we're all tipsy it's okay um, oh I, I miss that <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of what that means like are your boobs that are like mysterious and indifferent I, don't, <laughs> yeah, I, I think you mean that like they're perfection and, and classic that's what <laughs> I feel like we've shifted topics now. <laughs> the next section is just Lola's boobs. <laughs> um, well, this again has been a, a, a fascinating dive into, I, I think what I'm going to take away from this mostly, and I, I don't, everybody can take away their own things, obviously. Um, I think these past couple of years, maybe in the past decade or so, has really become a reckoning for rethinking so much of what we see and how we believe we are behaving for certain reasons. Um, and it, it, it makes me think of basically what we were talking about at the top of the show with sex positivity and us, you know, like paddling in the same direction. Now I'm thinking of paddling is it's, it's work. When, when we try to like take these behaviors that we've had for however long that, that our society or culture has normalized. And now we're like, well, let's re-examine them and see where they're coming from and if they're beneficial for us or not, or if they're harmful. That's, that's work. It's certainly a lot easier to keep things as they are, but it's, it's, it's going to be bad news if we do that. So it's the work, the work has its rewards as, as work often does. Um, with that said, I, again, I'm keeping an eye on the clock and uh, I wanted to make sure that we get on to our next section, which will be the, uh, 
which will be the Q&A where people can text us their questions or ask them through the comments. We even have a couple of voicemails people have sent in. Um, but before we do that, I wanna talk a little bit more about uh, a little bit more about what we do here at the Mystery Box Show. Um, of course, as you all know, uh, we typically do stories uh, based on sex and sexuality, true stories. And we are going to have, we're going to return with our sex storytelling show uh, in on Valentine's Day in 2021. And those tickets are on sale right now. Let me put up the, uh, uh, the little graphic that we have there. Um, and if you go to mysteryboxshow.com, you can find those tickets. Um, and at that show, we're going to have uh, Aliyah Liebenau, who's one of our audience's favorite storytellers. She's told many, many stories with us. And we're also going to have Quran of the Quranical Podcast coming in from Pittsburgh on the live stream and so much more audience confessions. Again, tickets are on sale now at mysteryboxshow.com. Or if you're interested in another way of, uh, of attending the show, Here's something we're just announcing tonight. Anybody who is a patron of ours at the $5 level or higher at Patreon uh, is going to get free access to the live stream. Um, let me take off that little ticker for a moment uh, so you can see everything there on patreon.com mystery box show. If you don't know Patreon, uh, it's a place where you can support the creators, the artists that you whose work you enjoy and who you think contributes to the world in some way. So if you feel called to, um, we we love engaging with our patrons. Uh, you get early access to the videos that we release here on, uh, on YouTube. You get early access to our podcast. You get updates and behind the scenes, um, uh, sometimes special gifts, and just a way to, to, to be a, a, a closer part of our family. Um, and let's see. What else do I have to say? Also, if you feel uh, if, if you feel like you'd rather just make a one-time donation to the Mystery Box Show and support what we do, you can do that at PayPal uh, through paypal.me slash mystery box show. And those, uh, those URLs are right there. And they'll be available after the show in the uh, show notes as well down below in the video description. And of course, you can always keep in touch with us on all of our social media, uh, Facebook, Instagram, uh, our podcast, of course, uh, which comes out every other week with a brand new story. Um, and if you just want to find out what we're up to, keep up to date with our upcoming live streams or new shows or find out if we have something new in the works, uh, we have our newsletter. You can sign up for that at mysteryboxshow.com. So I hope you do, and I hope we'll, we all see you there. Um, and with that being said, it's now time to move on to your sex questions. Um, we have been uh, we've been collecting we've been collecting text messages and voicemails throughout not only this uh, this live stream tonight but for the past couple weeks. And if you still have tonight, if you have like that need to know sex question that you think our panelists can answer, uh, I'm sure that they can. And uh, we hope that you text it into us. So we're going to go uh, right into that right now. Um, Nicole, do you have uh, any questions coming in? from our uh, from our audience um yes uh where am i over here <clears throat> um we had one question from um from our texts, uh, sort of a more private one uh, to keep anonymous and asking the panelists uh for a recommendation um if you could have uh Let's see. If you're young, if you could have had your younger self read a specific book, what would it be? Great question. Just anybody dive in. Yeah. I yeah. love. Please. We can I go, we can go around the circle. Oh, Matthew loves the book. <laughs> uh, I love the book by Meg John Barker, Rewriting the Rules, and it looks at. Um, challenging kind of the normative rules around eight types of relationship, relationship to self, relationship to sex, relationship to love, and how do we learn how to, instead of holding on to these rules or making new rules, how do we sit in uncertainty and enjoy ourselves? Um, and I, I think it's a beautiful, great book. Eric, are you taking awesome. notes with these answers, by the way? <laughs> are you taking notes? We can put them in the description link. 
Um, you know, that is a great idea. And I will do that uh, once the podcast, once the, uh, once the live stream is over. Cool. Cool. Well, yeah. um, this sounds like, uh, like I'm promoting this just because she's here with us tonight, but I genuinely recommend uh, Stella's book all the time to people, Tongue Tied. Uh, the thing, <laughs> Eric and I joke about this all the time, the theme that you hear in uh, at the Mystery Box show over and over and over again at these stories is, things were awful and then we communicated and they got good. <laughs> and I feel like that is the key component to not just sex, but life. <laughs> and Stella, um, Stella, you are such a great writer. I know this is like a love Stella fest right now, but um, one of the things I love taking classes from Stella, but also reading her book, Tongue Tied, just uh, sometimes even I feel this way and I feel like I'm sort of submerged in the kink and sex positive community. Sometimes when I read other people's things or I go to their classes or see their lectures, I still feel like not kinky enough, not sexy enough, not enough, not enough, not enough. And Stella has a really good way of just being like, everybody's normal, everything's cool. Here's how you can relate to this in your life. And it's really, it's really user friendly, I guess is the best way to say it. Um, I'm sure there are other books like that as well. It's just, that's the one that really resonates with me. So check out Stella's book, Tongue Tied. It's so good. That's awesome. Double recommend here. Lola. Yeah. Um, I would have given myself the ethical slut just because it would have been a user's manual to what what my my life and then the I would have had less shame around it and um, more understanding of like how to how to be how to be better at it and safer. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things in that book that I think just as young me would have appreciated on so many levels that would have helped me not feel all the things that I was feeling at 20 and well, not even 20, like 17, 18, 19, you know, that, that age. Um, Lola, can I ask you to say a little bit more about that book? I know it's almost iconic at, at this point, but for anybody who's not familiar with it, yeah. what, what is the ethical slut? It's a, it's a, it's basically a guidebook on being sexually positive for yourself and like kind of, not it's not just the stance of like you using the word slip but like what does that mean and what does that mean for you and how do you navigate it and then it touches on different points about our sexuality and like how we experience jealousy i mean my my chapter on jealousy is like falling out of the book because i read through it so much <laughs> and it has so many marks on it and, and it touches on some things with non-monogamy but it really just is this book that goes all the things that society has told you is awful uh, about being a person who likes sex and wants to have sex with multiple people. It's not right. And here's a better way for you to understand the way you your inner workings and, and like that you're not a bad, dirty person um, unless you want to be, uh, you know, for, for wanting multiple partners. It's just a really nice book of validating your sluttiness and, and, who you are as a person and not feeling like trash, like everybody wants you to feel. Yeah. Right, that's a good recap, a good, uh, a good, good reads. Yeah, and actually uh, Janet Hardy, who co-authored that book, right? Mm -hmm. She co-authored it with Dossie, um, actually tells a story with the Mystery Box show that you can find on our YouTube channel to hear more about that. It falls in line with that topic of the ethical slut. It's a really good story. I'm sure Eric uh, can link that in the description too. I <laughs> shall, I shall. Giving you homework. Um, Stella, uh, book recommendation for you to your to younger Stella. Yeah, I'm I'm again, I'm furiously taking notes. I'm gonna have to put together a list of book recs. I don't know how I can like do just one. Um I Ethical Slut came out when I was 18 and definitely rocked my world. A couple of other big ones when I was in college, um, Inga Musico's Cunt and Natalie Angier's Woman. Um and a book that didn't exist when I was a teenager, but I wish did, was Emily Nagoski's Come As You Are. Mm -hmm. um, I probably once a day to suggest to somebody that they read that. Um, so I broke the rules. That was more than one book. But um, <laughs> I have kind of a book problem. <laughs> You're allowed. Uh, Come As You Are uh, is from somebody who has been teaching 
sex and gender uh, at the college level for a long time um, and really wants everybody to feel normal and okay and talks about all the stuff that bodies do and the ways that desire works. And really it's sort of one of these like popular science books for lack of a better term and takes these concepts and puts them in a way that anybody can understand. Um, and I think really just helps normalize a lot of things that make people feel broken. Um, you know, it's been the theme sort of tonight is everyone wants to feel normal. Um, and she has access to all this information sort of showing you like you are normal, like how, whatever your body is doing, however it looks, like as long as you are not in distress or pain, like it's fine, it's normal, it's great. Um, whatever your level of desire and so on and so on. Um, so it, it, I think it really helps people feel um, like they feel better in their skin and understand how their bodies and brains work. There's an updated version too, and it's on audio. I know that because it's on audiobook. <laughs> I got the updated version and there's a workbook. Yeah, I love. I didn't workbook. know there was a workbook. I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah, it's one of the homeworks I like giving clients. Yeah, Stella, I had uh, forgotten about cunt until you just now mentioned it. I read that in my early 20s and it was life altering, especially in the realm of like reducing shame, but yeah. not just reducing shame, but also celebrating. I think there's a dip celebrating our bodies and what they do. That book yeah. was amazing for me. Yeah. One yeah I I recommend. The sticker, it was like on my car. Um, I was just like, so outrageous. My car has a cunt sticker on it, but that was like, <laughs> Yeah, at where I was then, like, I was, you know, it was, I mean, that was sort of the shame thing. Like it would make me blush that I was there, but also just like trying to lean into that. Oh and yeah. I worked at Barnes and Noble at the time actually. And when people would come in and ask for it, they would be like, can I talk to you privately? About what I'm <laughs> I can't even say, they couldn't say the word out loud. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I couldn't either to be fair. <laughs> it, it almost reminds me, uh, and I don't know if this is a, of a certain age bracket, but uh, when Eve Ensler came out with the vagina monologues, um, I don't know if this was the policy at every theater, but at least the theater that I went to, uh, people weren't allowed to purchase a ticket unless they asked for it by name at the box office. You had to say, I would like to buy a, per a ticket for the vagina monologues. You couldn't say like, uh, one for tonight's show, please. Um, <laughs> And, and I was somebody who specifically, I remember struggling with that word and that was that was a barrier for me. Um, and I'm, I'm glad our culture seems to have at least tried to move on that beyond that now. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's been a progression and thankfully thankfully there's been a progression. Um, Nicole, do we have uh, more, more text coming in? Yeah, we do. Um... For our panelists, do you think poly is particularly challenging for some sexual orientations over others? Personally, I find this um, hard with heterosexual women and men in comparison to what I see from LGBTQ groups. I'm not even going to touch wanna... that. <laughs> That's big. I don't, yeah. Research doesn't. Um, what I'll say is there's a myth that polyamory is harder than monogamy, and that that's not the case. And I will say that like non-monogamous or forms of um, relating are more normative in different uh, cultures. So yeah, it's gonna be harder for some because that normative expectation isn't there, but um, I think it all comes down to that fact that learning how to communicate, especially around jealousy and navigating that one jealousy is a common feeling and how you do repairs around that probably gets to work in any kind of coupling. Yeah, I think there might be this thought that it's, and I think there's a lot of, um, oh, what's the word? Uh, not untruths, I can't think of the word that I wanna say, but around what heteronormativity is or heterosexuality and monogamy and what are all of those things. And really, I mean, I'm not a monogamous person. I've tried it for a really long time. I suck at it. I'm not good at it, but I know people who are amazing at it. And I think there is such thing as good monogamy and there's toxic monogamy and monogamy that's not great. A lot of people are practicing toxic monogamy. Let's be real. That's, that's the problem is that they're not, there's not a lot of healthy 
relationships happening. So when people see a different relationship type, that if you are doing it in an ethical way has to be done with so much conversation and time and talking, it's like, oh, this is better. And it's like, no, no, because good monogamy needs to involve, like good monogamous people could also benefit from the Google calendar. Let's just be real. (laughs) Google calendars are amazing, (laughs) keeping everybody's schedule. But that, I think that's the thing. It's like what you're taught is how relationships are supposed to work are usually shitty and not great and need to be broken out of. And it doesn't mean you need to be polyamorous. It just means you need to start talking to each other more, which if once everybody goes to therapy, that's what they get told. And they're like, yeah, you need to have a conversation. It's like, what? I have to talk to my partner. So I think there's just this misconception that it's so hard for maybe straight folks because people, I think people think everybody who's queer is, polyamorous, which is not true. There's so many people who are practicing monogamy in the LGBT community. Um, but even that you have to talk, there's a lot of conversation when you're when you're not the normative, right? Like in, in anything where you're not the normative, you're not the baseline, there's always going to be conversations and things. And I think um, that cis straight folks just need to learn how to talk about things more. And they, they too can have easier relationships. Again, pick up Stella Harris's book, Tongue Tied. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? Uh, in case you're wondering where Eric went, he just came down to the living room where I am. <laughs> I don't know why. And now he's going back upstairs. <laughs> he will be joining us momentarily. <laughs> Were there more questions, Nicole? I know we all, oh, there he is. Oh, he's back so fast. <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, my, my, my fancy hair changed. <laughs> uh, I've got these giant cans in my head. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I, I wanted to make sure that we got to some of our voicemails uh, that were sent in. So uh, I'm going to play one of those right now for us all. And then I think we'll wrap it up with one more text, uh, one more text message after that. So here's here's a call that came in just two days ago. Hi. So I don't know if this is a weird question or not, but all in all, I'd say that my sex life is really quite good. And my partner is very enthusiastic, which is wonderful. But they keep doing what I can only describe as sex moves found in porn. And as much as I like their uh, desire to try new things and be um, energetic, it just doesn't really work for me because some of the things are just a bit over the top. Um, So what is the best way to communicate to my partner that I don't want them taking their sex advice from Pornhub? (laughs) So uh, if you can answer that, that'd be great. Thank you, and that would help a lot. Bye. All right. So, Great question. <laughs> any any thoughts on that from uh, anybody in the panel? Stella has her hand raised. Well, I think what I'm hearing there is it sounds like part of the problem is not where the ideas are coming from, but maybe that he is getting surprised by them in the middle of sex. Um, which, <laughs> when we we're talking about talking. I think it is not a great plan to surprise somebody with new kinds of sex without talking about it first. I think porn can be a great place to get fantasy ideas, um, but it is, you know, it is fantasy. It's not sex ed. I think maybe what's missing here is conversations Um, and like this notion that something is over the top also then suggest, like we've been saying all night, like, well, then there are certain right kinds of sex to have and whatever this other thing is, is outside of that right kind. Um, So yeah, I think maybe they just need to sit down and talk about what what do each of them desire? You know, what are the turn-ons? What kinds of sex do they wanna be having? What are they getting out of it? You know, for the partner who's trying the porn sex moves, you know, are they trying to maximize pleasure? Or do they think that's what they're supposed to do? Um, it just sounds like there's a really long kind of heart to heart to happen there. Stella, you have a really good uh, link. I think you probably still do for a yes, no, maybe list. Oh, mm-hmm. Could you maybe explain what that is? I found that to be really awesome and helpful and, and, and yeah. do to do another one because it changes. 
Yeah, I mean, if you just Google yes, no, maybe list, you'll find tens of thousands of them. I have one on my website at stellaharris.net slash kink, but I think my favorite one actually lives on the Autostraddle website. They have a really in-depth yes, no, maybe list. The idea is that it is just a menu of options. So like if you remember when we went to restaurants um, and you get sort of the menu of, of what's available there so you don't need to think off the top of your head of all of the food that exists in the world, what do I want right now? And so this is sort of a menu of options around sex or kink and you can get them uh, sort of tailored to new, kinkier stuff, less kinky stuff, whatever. But if you and your partner both fill those out, you can get online ones that you can fill out um, and then you can compare your answers. And it is not the end of the conversation, it's the beginning of the conversation. So if you both you know, ticked a box for spanking, then you get to sit down and talk about like, what do you mean by spanking and how hard and in what context and in what position and how do you want to feel when we're doing that? Um, but if you're a giant nerd like me, you know, having the paperwork and the homework and taking notes, um, but it can help to start the conversation again, if it is from this sort of outside place, it can feel less intimidating than saying like, gosh, I've been fantasizing about this thing forever. Can we try it? Instead, it's like, oh, I saw this thing online, which is also one of the reasons we get ideas from porn. It's, it's often like also just the only sex we have access to. Um, you know, I mean, some of us like get to watch our friends have sex, which is super, again, not recently, but like in theory, um, but otherwise, you know, porn is really kind of one of the only ways we get to see how people have sex. Um, and a yes, no, maybe list is another way to sort of get a list of options of what is potentially available and maybe help start that conversation. That's a great recommendation. I say that's one of my, that is one of my favorite ways of having yes, no, maybe described. So, Yay. I'm going to, uh, taking a cue from Reba's suggestions, I'm going to also put a link to uh, to the Autostraddle yes, no, maybe list, as well as the one on your website, uh, Stella, um, in the video description. So check for that a day or two after the live stream has, uh, has been posted. I would also suggest to that person calling in, if they do choose to have a, a conversation or do a yes, no, maybe, to do it um, with enough time between sex sexin <laughs> and yeah. not just just spring it on the person when it's about to happen like give yeah. give it a day or two and have a conversation outside of the bedroom i think that helps alleviate some pressure as well yeah. and maybe and maybe not connected so much to the sex like keep it to the hey these position things like i would even maybe have questions like hey like where where did you see this um is it just something you were trying or or does this really feel good to you or do you think it should feel good to me? Mm -hmm. Kind of keeping it to the positioning, but I would ask questions. I'm curious about what positions are happening. Um, <laughs> but I'm like, ooh. But yeah, I think if you can go like, listen, I love having sex with you, but when you like do that inverted jackhammer thing, it's not my favorite way to have sex with you and not make it about like the sex that you're having with them. Just be kind about it. And yeah, I would wait like some days, like don't do it right after. Don't do it during. <laughs> don't, do it. don't do it during. Um, yeah, cause it could be, it might be a funny thing. They might go, oh, I thought you were enjoying it. And they might laugh about it. And it might be this like, oh, I was trying to spice things up and I was trying to do something different. And it'll be this moment where they're like, oh, you don't need that, you know? I think this goes a lot towards, again, what we've been talking about, normalizing the conversation around sex, because I think we often just, just relegate sexual talk to the bedroom. That's the only place that sex talk is allowed. And that's where I have to engage in it. And usually it's when sex is happening. And like I said, that's that's normally the, the highest stakes uh, time to have those conversations. So if we can normalize the idea of talking about it while on a stroll somewhere or on a date sometime, or you know, just after you finished the third episode or whatever season you're watching of Game of Thrones, whatever. <laughs> um, uh, we have time for one more question uh, tonight. Nicole, do you have uh, one more question 
to wrap up on. I unmute myself. Okay. Yes. Uh, we have a question again through the anonymous text line. Um, thoughts on starting your partnered sexual journey later than usual. So maybe in your mid to late twenties um, or beyond that. Returning that to this idea. Question or just mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Was it just thoughts on? Was uh, I, I mean, I feel like that is the question uh, that also ends with not asking for a friend. <laughs> um, so it sounds like this particular person is maybe starting their sexual journey with other people um, a little bit later than what we consider like the norm. If if the norm is, um, I don't know, early 20s, late teens. Um, so thoughts on or maybe advice for someone starting that journey later. Mm -hmm. It feels like we're wrapping great, up tonight on that great idea time of, to start sex. Of like, <laughs> right. <laughs> like I, we we know ourselves and we're able to have different kinds of conversations when we're older. Like I think that's an uh, I always think there's this really strong idea that there's a normal time to start sex. And the idea of when that normal time is, like I look and think about when my normal time was versus when I was in my mid twenties and I trust my mid twenties self more than I trust my, you know, younger self. So I would just say like, what an amazing time to start having sex. Yeah. I think we, this conversation I think happened once, didn't it on the mystery box stage. And I've talked to a lot of clients about this. I do think we, again, our culture sort of tells us there's this like peak, late teen, early 20 time that everybody is figuring everything out. But a lot of people, that's not true. A lot of people are figuring things out late 20s and well beyond that. And it doesn't get talked about, again, because of shame. People think they're doing it wrong. And so then they're not talking about it. And so then you're not hearing about it. And it's perpetuating this idea that there was a right time. Mm -hmm. um, but it it is not that uncommon in my, you know, anecdotal experience with with clients, a lot of people are, are starting with other folks or with themselves considerably later in life than we normally hear about. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's fine. And you're right, like, that's great. I made better choices in my 20s than I did at 17, 18, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a misconception that the sex we were having when earlier was good sex. <laughs> Which I'm not saying no one had, <laughs> right. And I'm not saying no one had it, had good sex, but a lot of, I mean, a lot of the cis women in my life didn't have orgasms until their um, early 20s, early to mid 20s, sometimes not even until they were in their um, late 20s, early 30s, weren't having like really good sex. And it was because they were, they knew their bodies better and they were also very vocal about their bodies and what they needed in order to get to a certain place. That's something that you don't always come into when you're younger. So I, I'm, I'm for it. I also feel like you have a better pool of experience. Like when you're, if you're 17 and having sex with 17 year old, that's what you got. That's what you, you don't have. There's not a lot to everybody's in that. We don't know what we're doing. So if you're like 22, 23, you know, not saying you're not going to meet some people who don't know what they're doing, but you have a wider pool. Also, it is so much more appropriate for you to be dating a 30 year old when you're 23 than when you're 17. <laughs> so if yeah. you go that route for some experience, it's OK and legal. So, <laughs> OK. And I, I would say if someone can't if someone focuses on that idea, then that's more about them than it is about you right. like that. That tells you everything you need to know about how they're probably going to approach it. Yeah. I think that's a great place to leave it for tonight. Um, thank you all for joining us, uh, our panelists, everybody who tuned in, and anybody who's watching uh, on the live stream replay. Um, you are all our sex people, and that's really what the show is all about. Uh, so thank you to our panelists, uh, to Matthew Garrett, Reva Sparrow, Dirty Lola, Stella Harris, um, 
everybody who's watching tonight, everybody who's hanging out, a special thank you to everybody who sent in a question. Um, if we didn't get to your question, maybe we can get to it another time. I hope we can. Uh, thank you to Nicole Perkins for handling all the chat and interacting with everybody. Um, and don't forget, tickets are on sale for our Valentine's Day show at mysteryboxshow.com. Um, you're all fantastic. So have a wonderful night. It was, it was such a fun time to hang out with all of you. Have a great weekend. And uh, from us here at the Mystery Box Show to all of you, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Hey,